inside the transgender movement, you start to see these things uh, become normalized, like the interchangeability of men and women. And I find that to be particularly absurd in an actual rewrite of reality. In my perfect world, I would outlaw same-sex sodomy altogether. I wouldn't okay. create any type of punitive punishment for same-sex sodomy. I just simply wouldn't be overtly accepting nor give it any type of promotion within society. Wouldn't treat them as second-class citizens or, or anything uh, to that effect. But what I wouldn't do is do any type of promotion for it whatsoever. And so that would be my, my perfect society. However, we don't live in a perfect society. Understanding that, what I would do instead is say, okay, you can have civil unions and leave the institution, the religious institutions alone. You may not know this, but many of the LGBTQ rights advocacy groups put out memos all the time as part of their organizations that specifically want church outreach. And the reason that they want church outreach is because, well, if you have churches on your side, it's much, much, much easier for, for them to uh, produce acceptance in general society through the church. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a kind of a very, very common thing that happens. I have a lot of documentation on it if you'd like to see it sometime. But this is a, this is a very common occurrence. It's uh, at the ground level, the externalities that come from homosexuality, including things like HIV, high STD rates, um, you, you're talking about uh, uh, things like even fecal incontinence, all kinds of uh, horrors that come out of this, this particular demographic, 2.5%, not to mention the overt pedophilia rate. I don't think that the normalization was good, and I think that it also led now to the transgender movement, and inside the transgender movement, you start to see these things uh, become normalized, like the interchangeability of men and women, and I find that to be particularly absurd in an actual rewrite of reality. So where, uh, out of curiosity, where do you think um, gay and trans people come from? Because I, I have my own theories, but I'm really <laughs> curious about yours. Where do they come from? Sure. Well, I think uh, homosexuality is a massive byproduct generally of grooming. They can't reproduce. So they can't reproduce. There's nothing within a genetic line that can ever be pointed to. There's no genes for it, for instance. The only thing that can really be indicated for is environmental. So I think that it's very, very likely, and you can actually find evidence of this by looking at the acceptance rate. And then if you look at the acceptance rate, the amount of that homosexuality has climbed since the acceptance rate has been climbing has been astronomical. Essentially, as it's become more trendy to be gay, more people are gay. Now, what the counter to that usually is, is that, hey, the reason that that's happening is that there was always all of these gay people. They were just too afraid to come out. Yeah, so can, can I, I need to ask a question right there. Then. Sure. What do you, so how do you explain, um, for instance, like, I don't know, bisexuality in history? How do you explain natural, like, uh, basically, like, animal homosexuality? How, how do you explain all of that kind of stuff? Oh, so those are, those were always traditionally, uh, as far as the criteria went, considered a mental illness. It's For animals? Also, well, as far as animal homosexuality goes, so to kind of flesh that out for you, the only animal that will engage in homosexual activity when there's not uh, another sex available for them to mate with is a sheep. Okay. It, just a, not trying to be a dick, just mm -hmm. trying to explain, you know, what I've heard. It's not true. Okay. They, they, they're, there's plenty of animals that practice homosexuality, basically. Like not when there's a viable female available, except okay. sheep. I'll, I'll get there. So, <laughs> so yeah. basically okay. what, what I was going to say is that, um, you know, there's basically like flies that literally don't have time to check whether or not they're male or female. They'll bang dudes. Uh, you know, basically like, you know, dolphins have practiced homosexuality. I'm pretty sure pigs practice homosexuality. I'm pretty sure that, and like, yeah, when a viable female isn't there, but is that not indicative of bisexuality at least being natural at some point? Well, not really. The, the Why? How? Because, because animals often do that as far as an engagement of dominance goes. Uh -huh. And it doesn't actually have anything to do with sexual preference. Now, if they were engaging in that type of activity when there was a viable female around and they were engaging between both, maybe that would be a good indicator for bisexuality. But the indicator of dominance is much more prominent. 
And since anytime there's a viable female around, only sheep, as far as I know, inside the mammal world are the only ones who will actually choose a male partner. So are sheep are sheep just like uh, you know like a degenerate species or something? How do you explain There's, that? There there are reasons for that. I don't remember exactly what they were. <laughs> I'm but fucking around. If you're so looking the, at only if if you're only looking at like the dumbest the dumbest mammal, who mm -hmm. you know sheep, where you call people sheep I, literally because you know they're acting no. like sheep. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's a great indicator. Okay, so I, I would like to explain my worldview because I think it's completely different from yours. Um, so what I would say is, in the natural world, uh, there, there's homosexuality and bisexuality. I would say within the human world, there's bisexuality guaranteed. So uh, Dennis Prager, you know, Jewish conservative, maybe it's all part of the conspiracy. Uh, but, you know, you talk about like Greek or Roman society, bisexuality was common. I'm pretty sure pre-monotheistic uh, pre Persian culture was also bisexual. That's true. Um, so what I would say is that like within these, these realms, what I would say is bisexuality and homosexuality is probably natural. Also, what I would say is that uh, basically a lot of these things, th this is my personal theory. Nobody's backing me up on this. This is my personal theory, Okay. My personality, or my personal theory, is that a lot of these things are endochronological. Uh, what I, or not, excuse me, not in endochronological and also in utero. Uh, what I mean by that, and endochronological means hormonal, and in utero means like during birth. Uh, human children um, in the in the uterus or whatever, they are bombarded with hormones and bombarded with all sorts of things in order to grow into viable humans. Uh, we typically start out as, uh, you know, XX and then transfer into XY. Uh, as we progress, XY is, uh, you know, the male version of it. Um, I think that hormones very likely trip different genetic um, switches as, uh, you know, people be either become male or female. Um, this pretty much explains intersex people, uh, people who have both sex organs. This also explains, you know, how we become male, how we become female, all that kind of stuff. Um, and as a result, what I would say is when a man be, is a homosexual man. He wasn't abused. There was no grooming. There was no kind of, you know, environmental factor that triggered him to become homosexual. What I would say is that's probably endocrinological in utero. Same thing with a, a lesbian female. It's probably endocrinological in utero. I would also I appeal. Well, so, final point. Final point. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so final point would be that, like, if we're looking at humans as historically bisexual creatures, if we look out in the natural world and we find signs of homosexuality or bisexuality, um, then what I would say is that there can be uh, there can be reasons why monogamous heterosexual relationships and a family structure are absolutely evolutionarily dominant and positive for society, while still these underlying natural truths being there. And these underlying natural truths for me, especially as somebody who like values liberal and libertarian society, I would say most people who are heterosexual and uh, basically want a monogamous relationship or whatever, they should probably consider a traditional family structure. People who are uh, bisexual or homosexual, they should be allowed to go do their own thing. But basically, you know, I, you know, that that's kind of where they should go do their own thing. And the, the majority of society fits into the box that we probably both agree is largely healthy. So let's move back, right? Sure. Because the, there's a bunch of things you just mentioned there. So the first thing that we'll get to is when you say that previous societies were bisexual. No, they weren't bisexual. To clarify, there may have been bisexuals in those society, right? That would be the more accurate way to phrase that, wouldn't it? I don't think so based off of the history of Roman Greece. So everybody in Roman Greece was a bisexual then? No, I have no idea what the stats are. I wasn't around. Okay, but I'm well, pretty then, sure, like, I'm pretty sure accurate. pop culture, no, so, <laughs> in, pop, in, in pop culture, basically, like, based off of, and I'm not saying pop culture, like, what were shown on TV. I'm talking about, like, in their popular culture. Basically, what their buildings and their architecture and their pottery and all that kind of stuff, they had depictions of, you know, homosexuality, homosexuality and bisexuality, and it wasn't even thought of twice within those cultures. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty it sure within thought of, Roman... It was thought of twice. Well, actually. I might beat you to the point, because basically within Roman society, society, it wasn't necessarily weak to have sex with men. It was weak to be a bottom. So that's kind of... So where... it was dominance-based. Sure. Right. So the thing so is, is what? that that's well, that's not an indicator that they were wanting to engage in the activity. It's an indicator that it was a dominance-based activity. Two, the issue that I take is when you say these are bisexual societies, it's not accurate. You're saying there's people inside of these societies who are bisexual. 
I'll yield that, that that's probably true. My third point of contention with what you're saying is you're saying that essentially you think people are born this way. You have a, you have a massive problem there though because people change their sexuality, sexuality midlife all the time and their chromosomes don't change. How do you explain you, that? 